Uh, okay, so today's session is going to be uh, on algorithms, NFTs, and standard assets. And then Nardos will continue uh, on building dApps with Algorand blockchain. So I'm going to start on uh, Algorand NFTs and standard assets. I'm just going to go over some basic slides about uh, Algorand NFTs and standard assets. Then we'll dive into the implementation of uh, creating assets on Algorand's blockchain and transferring uh, by using different APIs. So uh, on Algorand, uh, the, uh, we can change the blockchain state. So uh, there are different ways to change the blockchain state and transactions are the core elements of blocks which define the evolution of distributed ledger states. And there are six transaction types in Algorand protocol and these uh, transactions are the ones that change the blockchain state. The first one might be the payment, key registration, asset transfer, uh, asset freeze and application call. Uh, by uh, implementing one of those, we, will, we can change the blockchain state. And uh, in order to be approved and committed into the block, transactions must comply with uh, the first one. Every transaction must be signed. So uh, one can just simply create an asset or uh, transfer an asset, but unless he or she transfers, uh, unless he or she uh, signs the asset, that won't be committed into the blockchain state. So in order to be verified uh, or approved by the blockchain, by the blockchain state, but by the blockchain system, uh, one needs to sign the transaction. And the second one is fees. So transactions fee, transaction fees are a way to protect the network from DDoS. Uh, so, uh, so some might just try to create multiple transactions, which is not relevant or just as a DDoS attack. So uh, what Algorand implemented is it will uh, charge some amount, which is 0 0.001 algo uh, or one micro algo on every transaction, which is different from other blockchain systems. Uh, in Ethereum or other blockchain system, the fees are primarily used to for miners. So the more fee you provide, uh, the quicker your transaction will be processed. But in, in our ground, it's different. Uh, the fees are just a way to protect from the network from DDoS attack, and uh, it will be uh, added to each transaction or asset creation uh, or any type of state that will change the blockchain. And the last one is the round validity. So to handle, val uh, to handle transactions item potency, let, uh, letting the archival nodes participate in algorithm consensus, transactions have an intrinsic validity of 1000 blocks. So what this means is that uh, one can set the time that the blockchain uh, transaction state will be implemented. So one can specify when the blockchain state or when the blockchain, when, when the blockchain's block is from a specific uh, block to uh, at most some specific block. So the the, 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 the maximum is 1000 blocks. So when the blockchain reaches within that specified block, that transaction will be implemented. Uh, and NFTs, so what are NFTs? NFTs are non-fungible token and non-fungible tokens are just cryptographic assets on blockchain which with unique identification codes and metadata that distinguish them from each other. So an NFT is a unique token, in, especially in blockchain. It's a unique token generated by someone and uh, that specific token cannot be replaced or interchanged with another token. So once someone verifies or once someone signs uh, after creating an NFT with the total amount of one, that will be a specific uh, NFT and will be unique and it cannot be interchanged with uh, another uh, asset. So unlike other assets, they cannot be traded or exchanged at equivalency. And this differs from fungible tokens like cryptocurrency, which are identical to each other and therefore can serve as medium of, for commercial transactions. So uh, if we, uh, for example, uh, use cryptocurrencies as an example, one can simply trade those cryptocurrencies uh, and each cryptocurrency can be traded or exchanged with one another. And they are not unique in nature, but in NFTs, uh, NFTs are uh, what makes NFTs different is that uh, each of the NFT or each of the asset created as an NFT is unique and cannot be treated or interchanged with another asset. And tokenizing these reload tangible assets makes buying, selling, and trading them more efficient while reducing the probability of fraud. Uh, so uh, in the blockchain implementation, it's much more easier. The implementation of NFTs are easier and one can simply, very simply, without even knowing um, uh, much about writing code, one can create uh, an NFT and 
uh, mint it into the blockchain and one can then trade it or sell it uh, for the given price. And as I said earlier, they are non-replaceable and non-interchangeable. And lastly, the Algorand standard asset. Algorand standard assets provide a standardized layer, layer one mechanism to represent uh, any type of a, any type of asset on the Algorand blockchain. And this includes uh, fungible, non-fungible, restricted fungible, and restricted non-fungible assets. So uh, by using the Algorand standard asset, one can create uh, a fungible or non-fungible NFTs and other types of assets by using the ASA or Algorand standard asset. We'll go over the main or major one of uh, assets that can be created on the Algorand blockchain. Uh, so now I'm going to go over. Uh, uh, I'm I'm just going to go over uh, some practical part. So the first thing is to run the sandbox and uh, start the sandbox. I've already started the sandbox. Uh, before going moving on, uh, is, uh, are you guys still uh, having a problem uh, starting the sandbox? Or how many of you are still having a problem starting a sandbox and interacting with the Algorand blockchain? Hands. Okay. Okay, so only for uh, only four of you are facing a problem, others, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, at first, let me just show you how we can interact with the sandbox. And uh, so for everyone to be on the same page and uh, because we don't have to waste much of our time uh, on the sandbox, uh, we'll also try to provide you uh, another alternative to interact with the testnet uh, of Algorand blockchain. Okay, so just to show you the basic commands that we can use on Algorand standard asset on Algorand sandbox, it's uh, already listed on their official GitHub account or on the official GitHub page. Uh, the first thing that we can do is, uh, sorry. Uh, the first thing that we can do is we can uh, uh, list the uh, available accounts on our uh, on our sandbox. So. Uh, by using dot sandbox call and minus h, minus h is just a help and we'll show you the basic commands that you can use uh, on sandbox call. We can also use this on sandbox. So if you guys don't even know how to start, uh, one can simply go uh, and type the help or minus h and we can see the list of available commands that we can use. Uh, so on sandbox goal account list, uh, this will list uh, Algorand sandbox will by default create about three accounts and those accounts are filled with some algos. These algos are not uh, real algos or we cannot use them on uh, the, minute, uh, uh, the minute of Algorand blockchain, but uh, we can use them on testnet and the dev network. So each, have, uh, each are filled with some algos and the next thing that we can do is we can also create a new uh, Algorand account, uh, or even get the uh, uh, the private key of uh, each account. So to do that, what we can do is we can use the same command. And to in order to get the uh, the the private key, the first thing that we are going to do is we we are going to get the mnemonic key. So to get the, the mnemonic key, we, we are going to use the sandbox goal account export. Then the address that we want uh, to get the mnemonic uh, key. So the sandbox call account export uh, minus minus address. Let me remove one of the, yes. So address in the address that I want to get the mnemonic key. And this has, uh, this will return the, uh, the mnemonic key that I want to use for the blockchain. So from this mnemonic key, one can simply uh, generate the private key or the public key uh, just by using the, uh, the mnemonic key. We will go over that. So after uh, getting the mnemonic key, as I've said, we can generate the, the private or the public key. I'm now going to show you how we can, how we can uh, create a new account. So we'll use the same command, sandbox account, goal account. And if we do minus H, uh, uh, we can see that there is an option 
which we can specify, uh, which we can use and it is new and new will create a new account. So I will use okay, sandbox call account new and this uh, will create a new sandbox uh, account. So we can use this account. Now if we go again and go account, Uh, now I should be able to see, yes, uh, I should be able to see that a new account has been created and it has zero micro algos. So this account has not been, uh, has not been filled uh, with some algos. So uh, now what I can do is I can uh, transfer some algos from one of the existing accounts to the newly uh, created accounts. And uh, I can see the new balance of uh, this newly created account. So to do that, uh, what I'm going to use is uh, it will be the same until goal, but then maybe let me display the available uh, the available options. So we can see that there is an option called clerk and clerk, clerk will provide the tools to control the transactions. And using clerk, uh, we can send uh, some algos to uh, the other account. Uh, clerk and from the first option is uh, the, the, the address of the account that's going to send. So I'm going to copy one of the public keys as some algos. And the second option will be two and I'm going to copy the newly created uh, account public address. And this, uh, and finally the amount that I want to send to the newly created account for now, maybe I'm, I want, I might want to transfer to algos that is uh, 2 million micro algos. Uh, okay, maybe I will. Okay, so dot sandbox. Cool. Clerk send, okay, I think I might have forgot, yes. Clerk and I should specify the send clerk. And this should send to Algos to the newly created account. And I can see that uh, there is an existing fee to every transaction that we are going to make on Algorand. And this should send uh, to Algos. To the new, uh, to the newly created. Oh. This. Uh, because that then account has about two algos or two million micro algos. So uh, on our on uh, we are satisfying using micro algos because uh, uh, Algorand uh, or blockchains normally uh, only take integers, so we can't say 0 0.01 algos or something. So every time uh, you may see that uh, the the number of algos, the amount of algos that are specified are in micro algos so that we can uh, always represent an integer instead of uh, decimal numbers. Uh, okay, now, so I'm going to show you how we can use this in uh, by using a, an SDK. So you can use Python SDK, JavaScript SDK, Java SDK, and so on. Uh, for now, I'm just going to show you how we can implement this by using uh, Python SDK. So, uh, one thing that I can recommend you guys is to always use their documentation. Uh, I believe that their documentation is uh, enough for this week's challenge implementation. Everything that you need or everything that you might want is all in the documentation. You might just refer or uh, go to watch some videos or something, but most of the things are already uh, on the documentation. So. Uh, to create the first transaction, we, uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to install the sandbox. I've already started the, uh, the sandbox. And next, uh, we need to install the, uh, the SDK for Python. I've already installed that. And um, in a virtual environment, mm, let me select. Uh, so I'm just going to show you uh, on a notebook so that we can see each step of uh, the transaction implementation and uh, we can have a look at the output of each uh, transaction. So the first thing that we might want to do is uh, we might need to create an account. Uh, we already have an account on uh, the sandbox, but we'll just create a new one. 
So I'm going to use the code from their official documentation. So maybe let me just remove this part and everything. So uh, account, uh, we can import after installing the Python SDK. Uh, from our ground, we can import the account in the mnemonic. And uh, when we use the account.generate account method on account, uh, it will return uh, a twofold. So the first one will be the private key and the second one will be the address. I can just print this. And by using the mnemonic from private key, uh, we can generate the mnemonic from the private key. Uh, and also uh, we can generate the private key and the public key from a uh, given mnemonic address. Uh, just to show you that. Uh, I'm just, I'm going to copy the mnemonic and uh, what I can do is, uh, okay. Private key from mnemonic. Mnemonic dot to private key. And I'm going to specify my mnemonic key, and we can also use this for <coughs> to generate uh, to to generate the public key. So public key from mnemonic. Yes. So from the mnemonic, we can call the method to private key and to public key, and this will uh, return the private and the public key uh, from the mnemonic. So we can see that it has returned uh, the private key and the public key are the same, but it doesn't go the other way. We cannot generate or we cannot get the private key or the mnemonic address from the public key. Public key is to be used by everyone or anyone can see the public key and list the transactions made by that public address. Uh, but private key is private for everyone and private key is used to sign uh, transactions and other private stuffs. So we now have uh, an address and uh, uh, we now have a public address and a private address. And to fund this account, we can use a grand faucet or other uh, dispenser. Maybe for now, let me just use, uh, yes, let me just use the existing account. Uh, so what I will do is call, uh, maybe, yes. I think let me export the mnemonic address from one of the addresses. So I will use this public key. And this is the mnemonic address, the mnemonic key. Uh, and now, mnemo two. And from this uh, mnemonic key, uh, will generate the public key pub will be from the mnemonic dot to private to end private private to mnemonic dot to public key this is public to and this is private to uh, so what I'm doing is I'm generating, I'm uh, getting uh, the private key in the public key from the mnemonic, and this will this should print uh, uh, yes, and we can now print the private key and the public key. Yes, so we now we now have the public key in the mnemonic key from uh, the account listed on the Algorand's default sandbox. And after getting this, uh, we can now skip the uh, filling out our account. We will later see how we can fill up our account. If we are not using the Algorand sandbox, we need to uh, fill or we need to have some uh, algos in our account because every transaction needs uh, a minimum of 0.01 algos for each transaction. Uh, but now since this account has some algos, we'll be uh, good to use these accounts. And to connect the client, uh, we'll use the uh, we'll use the algo d client and uh, this needs the private key in the uh, in my address so maybe let me go to the github page 
GitHub of Bitcoin. Uh, the sandbox. Uh, here we can see that there are different available ways to connect to the API endpoint. One of them is the AlgoD, the other is the KMD and the indexer. Uh, for now, we are going to use the AlgoD. So for a local connection, for the local endpoint connection, the address specified is HTTP localhost on port 4001, and the default token is a bunch of S. So we are going to use this token and the address to inst instantiate our AlgoD client. Uh, then uh, to check the balance of our account, you can also do that programmatically. We will specify the, okay, maybe let me. Uh, I'll provide the algorithm token and the algo address. And uh, for the address, we can use the uh, public key uh, and so uh, what this will do is it will get the account information and we are printing the amount uh, the, um, the uh, amount of the algos that are in the uh, account so we can see that we have uh, uh, some algos on our account so we can uh, send a transaction create an asset or so on so to build the first transaction uh, there are some parameters uh, specified that should be specified when sending a transaction or creating an asset. And we can use the default parameters. So to use the default parameters, we can just say that, uh, we can say the algo declined and don't suggest parameters. And this will uh, use the default parameters. And for down, for some of the parameters, we can manually go and specify. So for the flat fee, we can set it to true. and. For the fee, we can say that uh, the constants dot minimum transaction fee. So if you want to use the minimum transaction fee, we can specify this argument in the receiver, the note, the amount, uh, and so on. So I'm going to copy this section. And okay, so for my account, it's public too. Uh, so the receiver might be the first account that I have created. So maybe uh, we can print the uh, the balance for the first account. Uh, so the first account was address was named address. Uh, we can see that the first account has a balance of zero microalgos. So we are going to send some. Uh, algos from the second account that is in our default sandbox to uh, the previous sand to, to, uh, to the previous account that we created. So I'm just going to uh, copy the address and uh, in the receiver part, I'm going to specify the address. So this is going to send from uh, the new account, which is named pub underscore two to the address, which is the first account that we created and uh, the default parameters, the receiver, the amount that we send, we, uh, we, need to, we are going to send is uh, one algos. So we are going to send one algos to the newly created, to the previous uh, created account. And we just, we are just leaving a note and this note should be encoded when sending uh, this note. So uh, I'm just specifying the string as it's uh, shown in the documentation and encoding that. So, uh, after sending this transaction, the next thing that we can do is... Sorry. Sorry, Lydia. Sorry to catch you off like that. Uh, uh, can you please... Uh, I just lost you. Uh, can you please go over how you connect to the client? Uh, can you just explain a little, a little bit more? Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, so, I just want to stop you just before you go on too far. Sorry for that. No, no, no problem. So, uh, to create... Uh, when using the SDK, the Python SDK, when inst inst instantiating the algo client, we need to specify the address, the requirement arguments are the token in the uh, algo address and the default or uh, the given address from uh, Algorand sandbox that is specified uh, on their official GitHub sandbox page is uh, 
for the algo D, when we want to use the algo D API endpoint, the address specified on port uh, 4001 uh, on localhost, and the token is this token. And by using this token, we can instantiate the algo D client, and this should uh, instantiate the algo D client. Then we can get or we can retrieve the account information or uh, start to send any type of transaction that we want. We can also create an asset. We can send an asset. We can revoke an asset. We can uh, obtain from an asset or so on. Uh, am I getting your point or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very clear. Thank you. So uh, we use those uh, uh, keys and uh, address. So it's common yes. for. Uh, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Yes. This is for the sandbox. Even if you are on mainnet, you can use when using the sandbox. But uh, I will later show you how we can use the other API implementation to connect to the testnet, uh, mainnet, or beta net. Uh, on that case, we will use another token being generated from the account we will create. But for when using the sandbox implementation, this is the uh, default uh, token address that is specified that we should specify to connect to the sandbox to instantiate the algo client. Okay, thank you. Okay, Professor? So, uh, I just have a bunch of questions, <coughs> but let me just go on with uh, one. If anyone has your public key, does that mean he can translate it by using the uh, export address command and get your private ID? Uh, uh, wasn't that uh, public key? Uh, sorry? In my connection, my not be Sorry, uh, okay, we'll go on. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yes, okay, can. so you can't export. Okay, there might be a lag from my side. So you can't generate the, you can't get the private key or the mnemonic address by just using export. This is only available on the sandbox. But if I have your public key, I can't uh, get your uh, mnemonic key on my side. This is only available on the sandbox. So on both networks, on both, uh, even if we are on the, uh, the the test network we can't have i cannot have your private key no no Th that that's completely insecure <laughs> uh, i can't get your private yeah, exactly. key from that the given public oh. address. okay 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 let me ask just uh, one more question okay um, go, go on go okay. on okay well uh, i i set up uh, a test net uh, account but it doesn't appear okay. in when I run the sandbox goal account list, but I can make transactions using the test uh, network. I mean, isn't that supposed to come under my accounts? Uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? You can, uh, you can make the transactions, but what's not coming under your account? I can make the, I, I can make the transaction on the test network, I I, okay. I made several transactions, but when I run the command sandbox goal account list, the account is not listed under my uh, local machine, but it is set uh, up. It is it has been set up in the test environment. Okay, so you started with in your sandbox on the testnet network, and uh, after creating an account on your yeah, testnet, yeah. Uh, when you use this command, it's not showing up. It doesn't happen. exactly. Wow. But I know the test yeah. the account is there because I can see it uh, in the uh, what what do you call it? the Algorand account explorer. I can see it, it there, it's there, and I've made several transactions. Uh, okay, uh, uh, maybe is it is your sandbox caching? Can you try to clean your sandbox and restart that? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, about the problem, but okay. it might be a cache issue, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, maybe we'll look into that. Uh, but have you tried the uh, the question that you were asking on Slack? Uh, was it from your private key? Yes, actually, I misconfigured the private key. I was giving it another account's private key. That was the reason. Oh, 
Okay, okay. So transactions, the signature, uh, especially when the signature part of your transaction fails, it should be from uh, your from the private key that you used. If your private key is not matching with the public key that you used to send the transaction, that will definitely fail. Yes, that was exactly what I did. Uh, I was I was giving it another account's uh, private key. So okay. never mind. Nice, great that you said that. Uh, okay, so uh, we can now continue uh, the session. So uh, okay. So yes, so we specified the uh, sender, the receiver, and we didn't uh, sign the transaction. So this transaction might be sent, but in order for this transaction to be committed to the blockchain's block, we need to sign this transaction. So to sign this transaction, this is the command that we can use. We just can say the unsigned transaction dot sign, which is the available method on the unsigned transaction and specify our private key. And the private key uh, was, uh, what was the private key? It's yes, private underscore two. So uh, maybe uh, what, Yes, what the sum uh, was facing earlier was uh, if you, for example, use another private key which doesn't match with the public key that used for the sender, this will fail. It's, it's not, it won't fail here, but when you submit the transaction, um, let me copy this section and let me just cut this out and Tab. So if I now run this command, uh, we can see that this transaction should should have been authorized by this key, but uh, was actually authorized by six by the another account. Uh, but uh, what I can also do is I can copy the the first private key. Not this command. Sorry. I misplace the private key, let me just change the first letter, for example, and run this code block. And uh, uh, was this the same error that you were getting, Fasa? Right? Yes, yes, exactly. This yes. is the. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if you misplace the private key, if you are not using the uh, the correct private key, you will uh, get this this kind of error. Uh, for now, uh, I will use the correct private key, which is five underscore two, and we can now uh, after signing the transaction, we are sending the transaction to the blockchain. So this will send the transaction to the blockchain. Uh, so we need to make sure that the transaction has been successfully. Uh, delivered to the blockchain. So uh, there is a method called wait for confirmation. So we can give the algorithm client and the transaction ID that we got, and uh, we are going to wait for four seconds. Let me comment this out and uh, my address should be pub underscore two. Uh, great. So. Uh, so it has successfully seen the transaction with the transaction ID. So we can be sure that uh, our transaction is confirmed. Uh, and the transaction amount is one algos. The fee is 0 0.001 algo or 1000 micro algos. Uh, and the sender is this specific account or the pub underscore two and the receiver is this specific account. And the decode note uh, is hello world. Static account was zero micro algos and the amount transferred is uh, 1,001 1 million microalgos. I should have put the uh, the first uh, account address. I, I I used the wrong public address, but after getting, maybe I can print the balance. I can go ahead and copy this one, and I can print the new balance of not pub two, but uh, address, which is the first account that we created. So we can see that it has been filled with one micro algo, with one algo or one million micro algos. So this is the way that we can uh, uh, send uh, some algos to another account, and we can also create uh, an asset on uh, uh, on the blockchain. So let 
Mm. Yes, so to create a new asset, there are also some parameters that we need to specify. Once you go the first step, the rest of the steps that we need to create or we need to use are exactly similar. So uh, I'm just going over the official documentation and just copy pasting the code that is available on their official documentation. So uh, to create an asset, uh, they have specified for each SDK for JavaScript, Python, Java, Go, and uh, other uh, uh, languages. So I, I've copied the Python. Okay, is that the question under that? Yeah, I was wondering like uh, which uh, SDK should we go for? I, I was planning to use the JavaScript SDK since I'm just adept with JavaScript then Python. So uh, like, what do you recommend? Uh, okay, uh, you can use JavaScript. Uh, if some are very familiar or comfortable working with Python, they can use Python. But since you are going to be building uh, a web app on the front end, uh, you will most probably be using JavaScript for the front end. You are going to use some uh, JavaScript framework. You can also use the Python, the newly created uh, Python browser interface, but uh, if you are comfortable, go ahead with that. But you can go with the language that you prefer. You can use uh, Node.js sure, for the backend. Yeah, Amani. Uh, my question is, where uh, does wallets coming? What are wallets? Uh, okay, uh, uh, I will go over that. There is a separate session for the wallet. Okay, uh, uh, good question, uh, Amanuel. So, uh, if you see our current implementation, what do you think is the problem of the current implementation? Let's say someone wants to send. Uh, okay, uh, for example, Amanuel wants to send some algos to my account. So what do you think is the problem of the current implementation that I'm using? Anyone? Maybe uh, we are not uh, having a record of what we okay. sent and received. Uh, how are we not having the record of what you are sending or receiving? Let's say you want to send some algos to my account. Uh, every transaction is public on the blockchain and anyone can see what you sent, how many algos you have, if they have your uh, public address, right? Yes. So, uh, what do you think might be the problem of the current implementation? Uh, Anjanet. So, uh, we have to sign this transaction with our private key, right? So, in order to like successfully make a handshake yes. with, uh, with the... So, like, in order for us to do that, every time, like, we have to get our private key and uh, sign it. So like if we were to use wallets so that we have, we already have uh, our uh, private key uh, along with our public key. So it's it yes. would be easier to like sign it. That's yes. why. Assumption. Exactly. Yes, that, that's correct. So uh, on our current implementation, you can see that I'm manually specifying the private key. So if Emmanuel was going to send me some algos to my account, I need to get his private key his private key and put it manually into the application. So uh, just think of it that this is a wrapper API and we are using it on the front end. So to get this working, we need to prompt the user to enter the, their private key, right? They need to use or they give out their private key so that we can sign transaction and send the algos that they want to send it to. So this is totally not safe and no one would actually give uh, their private key because once I get access of any one of your uh, private key, I can control your uh, I can control your account and take all of your algos, maybe send some to someone, even you I can uh, transfer your entities or so on. So every account has its own private key and the public key is public to everyone and anyone can see what that specific person sent. Uh, the transaction that he made and the NFTs that he has generated or so on, on the public ad using the public key. Uh, but when someone uh, gets control of uh, his or hers uh, private key, they can control the entire account and there is no way there is no way of getting back from that. So this is totally not safe and no one would actually give you uh, their private key on a real world application. So that's why we need wallets. So wallets are uh, private key, uh, any kind of key management. And when we uh, sign up for a wallet, uh, okay, let me go to my other account. Uh, okay, so 
uh, we can see that uh, there is different wallet management for Algorand, for Ethereum, there is the MetaMask, and for Algorand, there is the Ledger, the Pera, and so on. So you need to provide the password, and these uh, wallets will provide you the private key that you want when making a transaction. So it will the the wallets will pop up. Just for example, if you are going to use uh, Algo Signer or MetaMask when you are working on Ethereum based applications, the wallets will pop up and uh, make uh, it will make sure that you sign the transaction by reading the instructions or it will tell you that it's this application is going to send this amount of algos to this account and are you sure that you want to send this transaction and you will finally uh, say that i accept and you will say send this transaction so wallets are a way of managing our private key and no one will actually put or use their uh, private key uh, statically here. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So basically what it, what wallets are doing is uh, just uh, encapsulate our or like hide our private key and like uh, give us the I mean do securely do uh, uh, or sign a transaction on our behalf, right? Yes, so without yes. exposing our private without key. exposing yes, correct. Okay, okay. So without exposing our private key, they will sign the transaction on behalf of the signed in user. So maybe if you are, yes, uh, when you are working on the uh, current application that you are working, you will integrate it with wallet. And uh, for example, let's say that you are the admin under that. Uh, and when you want to mint the asset, the wallet should pop up when you are going to sync the transaction or on this specific part, the wallet should pop up and uh, you should confirm uh, that you want, you actually want to send that transaction or you actually want to mint that asset. Uh, okay, for so. What do we mean by uh, minting an asset actually? Uh, okay, so minting an asset is uh, pushing the asset to the blockchain. So minting means uh, when someone mints an asset, it means that he's pushing the new asset to the blockchain. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's pushing the actual asset. Most probably you won't do that. You won't even uh, think of doing that because it's really expensive to push uh, an asset. Let's say that you have uh, an image, an NFT image. And uh, just as an example, let's say that it is uh, four meg, four megabytes, and you don't want to push uh, an asset of that side to the blockchain because making a transaction is really expensive and uh, verifying that that transaction is successful and working accordingly to other blockchain system, it's really expensive to work with that size of an asset. So what you will normally do is you will push the asset to uh, distributed file system. For example, in this case, you can use Pinata, just as an example. Pinata is a distributed file system that works well with blockchain systems. And by using third party uh, distributed file system, you can store the actual asset and just push the uh, the metadata, the metadata of the asset that is pushed to the distributed file system. So by that we mean that we are minting the asset to the blockchain, or uh, uh, maybe we are just uh, minting the uh, metadata of our actual asset. Our actual asset will live in another storage distributed file system, and the actual uh, and the metadata will be pushed to uh, the URL, or the actual metadata might be pushed to the blockchain. Yeah, I yeah, I understand. So, like the it will be like cryptographically encrypted, like when we just uh, when it's pushed to the blockchain, or it will be just uh, uh, put it. I mean, will be stored in the blockchain, like as it is. Uh, it will be. So, I think uh, on yesterday's session that Yababal gave in the afternoon, you should have uh, uh, so that the actual assets are identified by their head, which is in encrypted format. So, the head of each blocks in the blockchain uh, have some kind of encrypted format of the data. So there is a, a, some complex algorithm behind the blockchain implementation, but each data will be in some form encrypted and uh, will be available in the form that it is uh, able to communicate with other blocks and uh, for the actual verification of each asset that are minted on the blockchain. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Fasal? 
Yeah, so it's uh, just a quick question. So uh, NFTs and other uh, assets are just another form of transactions, right? Yes. So basically, uh, if we if the thing you showed us uh, works for us, the payment, the transaction dot payment txn function is for payments, and when we are going to do the NFTs, we are just going to change that function in the parameters that go inside. Yes. So when creating an asset, you can create an NFT. So in in your case, when minting an uh, when minting a certificate, you want to mint an NFT. So each NFT, each certificate should be unique. So uh, your certificate should be unique and should be uniquely identified from the other training certificate. So the way that you specify the parameters are what will define that if that asset is an NFT or not. So it's just changing the parameters that you are using when creating the asset. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Anjanet. So in our case, uh, can we just make, uh, for example, the let's say we uh, placed uh, our like uh, the PDF format or the certificate on uh, a, di a distributed file system. So like we we get this address of this uh, file system or the meta data, and can we just uh, mint that uh, as, as an asset to our blockchain, like? Uh, can we do such kind of thing? Uh, yes, so uh, maybe you'll have a, a unique certificate or PDF for each training. Then what you will do is in your program, the logic will be that you will uh, upload that certificate to a distributed file system because we don't want a failing system. Uh, the entire point of using a blockchain is a distributed file system with no man in the middle and it's completely distributed and not controlled by anyone. So you don't want to store your actual assets on uh, on a system that isn't distributed. So you are going to store that on a distributed file system. One example or one thing that one system that you can use is Pinata. Pinata is a distributed file system storage and you can push that uh, asset or PDF file to that uh, distributed file system and you'll get an, a URL of that asset that is uh, uploaded to that uh, the database or distributed file system. After you get the assets. Sorry, oops. you're being, I, I, can, I cannot hear you. Uh, okay, am I breaking? Is it from my side? Uh, I think it's from my side. What about now? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, now I can hear you. Okay, great. Yes, I can uh, hear you now. So where did you lose me? So like we can use, uh, for example, Pinata as a distributed file system and like you just uh, got. Yes, yeah. So uh, the first thing that you'll do is you'll push the uh, the PDF file to that distributed file system, and that should return a URL of the uploaded uh, uh, of the uploaded file, the URL of the uploaded file. Then you will just store the uh, you will create a metadata. Metadata. The metadata might just consist the name of the student that. Uh, you want the certificate to be generated in different parameters that you want for that specific training. So each training will have a unique identifier. So in addition to the certificate, you might just add the name of the training, uh, the grade that uh, uh, the, the score that they scored on when uh, going through your uh, training. And after having that metadata, you can store the URL of that metadata. Your metadata might be, for example, in a JSON format. Uh, in the metadata might consist of the URL of the uploaded file and some brief descriptions of your uh, training. Then you will also push that to some distributed file system because pushing the JSON format is also actually expensive. Uh, maybe if you don't want to go that much or uh, if you want to make it simple, you just can upload the uh, PDF file and just store the URL of that PDF file in an encrypted format. Okay, okay, I understand. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So, okay, let me just talk about uh, creating the assets. Let me copy this course section and the asset configuration. Uh, we might need to import some algo SPK. 
future dot transaction and yes. uh, I hope this should be enough. Uh, okay, so the sender, when creating an asset, we still need a sender that is going to mint the asset uh, to the blockchain. So our sender might be uh, the same sender that we used earlier, which is uh, pub2. Uh, let me know if there is a lag, okay, guys? Uh, I will change my network. Okay, so the manager, these are also some properties that you can specify. So the manager is the one that can uh, send, uh, that can manage, that can revoke the asset and that can control the asset. And all of the other properties are also uh, listed here. Uh, Yes, so the yeah, you can get the definition or yeah, you can get what each parameter means in uh, in the official documentation. So the freeze address is the one that can freeze the asset, the clawback address, the one that can revoke the address and so on. So you can uh, specify different uh, different accounts for each uh, for each parameter. So for example, the, uh, the creator might be someone and the manager might be the school admin uh, in the reserve and also the other, the freeze in the clawback might also be the school admin and the sender might be the director or so on. You just think about the logic that you want or uh, something that would actually make sense. For now, I can... Uh, I will just use the same... Yeah. All of the parameters. Okay. Let's just copy this one. And I'm going to remove yes. uh, And when signing the transaction, we are going to use the private key. So here again, we are using uh, the private key statically, but when using the wallet, uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, make it more dynamic. Or uh, we want be we only need to uh, specify we only need to specify the private key statically. So after. So after defining the parameters required, this is the asset URL or what I've been earlier. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the, this might be the URL or the metadata URL of the actual asset. So I'm just going to leave it as it is for now. And the total is the one. So if it's an NFT, the total will be one. So each train's, uh, each train's uh, total or each train's asset will be one because it is something that isn't replaceable, but if you see that it's 1,000, this can be broken into parts and one can send the asset. Uh, uh, for example, if I'm sending the asset to internet, I can send one of the assets from the 1,000 and I will be left with 999. And I can also send to each, uh, uh, to each person in the group. But if I specify one in the total, this URL, is the description or the metadata of the actual file or the actual PDF file in our case, and it will be unique to this specific uh, training. So, if we send this, if we send this asset, we won't be left with another asset to send to someone. So this will make it, uh, this will make it an, an NFT, and we won't be able to send that to uh, someone else. Uh, for now, I just can make it 1000 and the, I will just leave it the pass, but you will need to uh, implement some logic to uh, upload your data to some distributed file system and maybe generate a metadata and then uh, use that URL. And finally, I will send uh, that transaction using, I will sign that transaction using my private key. Uh, and maybe let me just remove this part. Yes, so, uh, so the result is confirmed in five rounds and the asset index is five, the confirmed round, and you'll get uh, other properties that we specified, the asset name uh, and so on. So this is how we can create uh, an asset on the sandbox. Uh, is that the question? Yes, Andrew. So the fact that we just make uh, the to total, of, uh, the value of total when we uh, configure the assets. So the fact that we do 
uh, we make it one like makes it uh, like act as a name NFT. I mean, like it's yes. it's, it's going yes. to be only one, so it won't be. Uh, yes, because more. this URL is going to be specific to this total amount. So maybe if I specify hundred, uh, I can send the same URL for different trainings, and this URL isn't uh, unique for each training, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Take it into 100 parts and that won't make it unique. But if I specify one, this should be unique for each training and each training will have their own uh, URL uh, of their certificate or so. Okay, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay, next one. Yes, so I wanted to ask a kind of similar question to Alexander. So it's uh, the fact that we specified it to be one. That means we have to make one for each, uh, a new one for each um, trainee of this. Yes. We have to yes. make a new asset for each. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe I will send you uh, the, what was it? Dmaps, not Dmaps. Uh, but there is a school or, uh, yes, I think there was a school that implemented this type of uh, NFT generation for each trainee that the, the, that that's going through their training. I will try to find that uh, link and I will try to send that to you. But each training will have a unique asset or a unique URL that's going to specify uh, the address detail of the training and that's going to be minted onto, into the blockchain. So this is the only difference between the fungible and yes. non-fungible assets? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, great. So uh, this is, I think, this is straightforward and simple, right? Anyone confused with what we have gone through the planting law? So is it clear for everyone? Okay. Uh, I'm assuming it is. Then uh, the next thing that I'm going to show you is how we can use uh, other uh, API in the points instead of the sandbox. So for those of you that are struggling, we can use uh, pure stake API. I think it's also specified, it's also uh, on the challenge document. So pure stake API is a way to run, a way to connect to Algorand's uh, blockchain on the mainnet, testnet or betanet. So for the free one, we can make about 500 requests per day, which should be more than enough for our kids. Uh, we just want it to, we, since we just want to experiment with it and start queries per second and so on. So we can just use the free uh, version of pure stake API. I will leave that, I'll drop that on the chat. So uh, let me just sign up, uh, let me just log in and go over the steps uh, with you together. Okay, I will uh, register for free. If you can. I will remove the private key later. Uh, okay. I will get the code and yeah, the question and uh, yeah, uh, what is the difference uh, between like uh, running our sandbox environment using uh, sandbox uh, dot slash sandbox app and like uh, using the testnet flag along with it? Uh, okay, so dot sandbox app. Uh, Okay, I might not be exactly sure, but I think the sandbox app starts your network on the dev uh, net. So the dev net is uh, a network that you can use for experimenting. It is very fast and it won't wait for four seconds for confirmation. If you are working with the main net or the test net, it's recommended that you work with the test net because uh, it's very similar to the main net. And once you work and verify that your application is working on the test net, you can easily uh, go to the minute or you can just change the configurations and use the minute. But on the div net, uh, it is very fast and uh, simple to use and uh, 
it won't wait, it won't wait for four seconds for the confirmation. But on the test net and main net, it usually waits uh, for four seconds for a confirmation. Okay, thank you. Uh, please explain what. Okay, so PureSec pure is an alternative for. Uh, okay, uh, PureSec is an alternative for the sandbox. So when using the sandbox, we used. Uh, uh, We used uh, this token and this address to connect to the sandbox and actually work with our blockchain. And pure stick, I'm just uh, showing this to you if you are still having a problem when working with the sandbox, with the local sandbox. Uh, pure uh, pure stick API is an alternative for the sandbox and you can actually connect to the mainnet, testnet, or uh, beta net of your blockchain. Gideon? Uh, so I had a question about pure stick. So there's no difference between that and the sandbox running locally. We can just use that instead for this yes, project. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But uh, since you won't use the dev network when uh, when using the pure stick, uh, there might be some luck, or you might have to wait for your transaction. Four seconds isn't too long, but maybe sometimes it might not be convenient when you are just experimenting with it. But it's okay to use uh, uh, either one of them. You can use the pure stick or pure stick the doesn't provide the the div the div net it only provides no the test i don't net. think it does it just provides the beta net the minute and the test net okay so it's just a log but there's no other functional yes. difference between that and no log. other difference yes okay thank you okay okay so uh, the first thing that you are going to do i'm going to remove this uh, account from I'm going to remove this API key when we in this session because this is private private to me and you should actually use this into in an environment variable but I'm going to use it uh, on my code uh, so that I just can show you how we can use the uh, the test net uh, when using the pure stick. So uh, I'm just going to go over uh, a written uh, code. So the first thing that we can this is exactly similar to the sandbox. You will provide the token. So the token is what uh, what we, we get, which is the API key that we get when signing up for PureStick. And we can put the, uh, the, the API key in the, algorithm, in the algorithm token. And the, the address is, uh, we have different addresses. So for the Algorand Bitanet, you have a different address. For the Algorand Testnet, you have different address. And for the Minute, you have a different address. We are going to use the Testnet. So for the testnet, it is this address. Oh, and yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, thanks. Okay. Uh, so uh, for the algorithm address, we are going to put the uh, we are going to put the algorithm testnet, and uh, the way that we use it in our implementation or when uh, when when instantiating our algorithm client, we should provide this uh, dictionary. So. The key is X API key. This is also similar in JavaScript or other languages. You just need to provide, you are going to use it as a header. It might be a bit different in JavaScript and other languages. You just have to uh, look into that. So I've provided the pure stick token as key uh, value pair and I'm running that. And I'm going to generate two different keys. And when instantiating the algorithm client, I'm going to specify the algorithm token, algorithm address, and as a header, I'm, like, I'm going to pass the pure stake token. And the next thing is uh, exactly the same as what we have been doing on uh, when using the sandbox. We are just checking the balance and we are specifying the parameters that we want to use. And I'm just going to send uh, some algos from the first account to the second account. I'm going to save one algo and wait for the confirmation. And finally, uh, okay. So uh, one thing we can use is that uh, since my account, I'm going to check in the account as well. It's address two. Okay, so since both of them are zero, when you are not using the sandbox, you might not get the uh, auto field account with some algos. So we can use this mensa. I think you guys are already familiar with it. I think I saw someone sharing. Uh, 
uh, someone shared that on the resource. So uh, you can use the algo dispenser. I think uh, there is also another site that will fill up uh, your account with some algos. I'm going to specify the account, the address one. Uh, and, and this should give me about 10 algos. And now if I go ahead and check for the amount, okay. Uh, yes, the, the, there is a confirmation lag, so it's going to wait for some seconds. So after the confirmation, we can see that our account has been filled with 10 algos, which is 10 million micro algos. Uh, after that, I can send uh, some algos to my existing, to the second account. And when I run this, at first the transaction sent with ID in the ID, then waiting for confirmation, and the transaction confirmed around uh, this amount of number. Since it's on the testnet, there there are lots of blocks, and it's going to uh, try to confirm that specific transaction among every block that is already on the testnet of the blockchain. Uh, so me, uh, one thing, uh, one other thing that I can do is I can check. Uh, not this one. Yes, uh, by using the Algo Explorer, you can go to the testnet and uh, check check for that specific transaction detail. So uh, we can see that this account has sent one algos to this account. This is the second address that I have used. Uh, then uh, what you are going to do just to show you the in the end logic of what you are going to implement on this week. At first, the admin uh, or the training uh, organization should create an asset or should create, <coughs> sorry, uh, should create an asset or should create the NFT or certificate for each training and mint that to the blockchain. After minting that, uh, when the, uh, the second thing, okay, maybe I should go to asset opt-in. In the ground. So asset opt-in uh, opt in an asset is uh, just sending uh, an asset with zero amount. Opt-in. Yes. Uh, okay. So when opting in an asset. Uh, everything is the same, but the amount that you specify is zero. So the sender is uh, the, uh, the trainee. In our case, uh, at first, the organization needs to mint the certificate of each trainee. Then the trainee will opt in for that asset. So the way it's implemented in Algorand, the Algorand implementation is that uh, one can transfer the asset if uh, the person that's going to receive the asset doesn't opt in. So, for example, if I am going to send the asset, an asset uh, maybe to Amanuel, Amanuel needs to first opt in for that specific asset by using the asset ID. Then, after he has opted in, I, I can send that asset to Amanuel. So, opting in an asset is the sender is Amanuel. Uh, he's opting in he's using his public address, and the receiver is the training organization that is the creator of that asset and the amount is zero. So this is uh, how Algorand can identify if the transaction is an opt-in or not. So if you specify an amount of zero and provide the asset ID, which is which Amanuel is, request, which Amanuel is requesting for the specific asset, this is called an opt-in. And after Amanuel has opted in for that specific asset, then the training organization can uh, transfer that specific asset. So the flow is going to be at first, the training organization will meet each asset to the blockchain, then the trainee, after the asset has been opted into the blockchain, the trainee will opt in for that specific asset based on the asset ID, and each asset will have their own unique uh, asset ID. After the trainee has opted in for that specific asset, then uh, the training organization can transfer that asset to the trainee and finally freeze that asset because after transferring the certificate to the trainee, we don't want the trainee, the trainee is going to be the account. Uh, 
uh, is going to be the owner of that specific account uh, of that specific asset and you don't want that trainee to transfer the asset to another person right so the manager or the account owner that the training organization can then freeze that asset so that the uh, the trainee won't be able to transfer that asset and it will stay unique to that trainee only uh, so yeah this is the flow with very encryption Okay, then I will assume everything is clear. Uh, to, okay, to bark. Okay, uh, you've mentioned that we can use like the dot sandbox app to uh, do the first transaction. So if we can do that, what is the reason that we have to run the uh, test uh, Nate app to do the first transaction? I think in the documentation, it's listed that we should run the testnet app first before uh, before making our first transaction mm -hmm. i i think it's okay if your sandbox is up in the devnet or the testnet not in on the in the minute because uh, on the minute you will need an actual algos when making some transaction but it's okay to use the testnet or the devnet uh, to make some transactions but the only difference that we have uh, when using the testnet is there might be some lag or some uh, confirmation uh, delay time when making a transaction, but it's fine to use any network when uh, running your sandbox. Is, is, is that clear, Mark? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, last night. Okay, uh, my question is about the assets. So while minting the assets from the organization, in our case, from Ten Academy. How do we know, like, how much assets to, how much assets do we have to mint? So we can, we might have 100 trainees or 50 trainees. How do we know that number, that specific number to mint? Or we, uh, should okay. we create a first request to mint and then opt? Uh, okay, so one thing that I can tell you is, there might be different scenarios and you might use different logic that, than uh, what I'm uh, telling you. But one thing that uh, maybe I can give you as an example is that each training organization will at least know how many trainees they have, right? So based on the trainees, uh, they might mint the assets to the blockchain and only if the trainee finishes the training successfully, they can transfer or they can send the requests to uh, they can send to the, the a request to the trainee to opt in for that specific asset. So it's, it, it, it can't it can't be dynamic. It can be dynamic, but based on your number of trainees or number of students in a, in an organization in a college or something, they can mint uh, all of the certificates or all of the assets to the blockchain. And uh, uh, each year, at least the organization will know how many trainees they are going to have and how many trainees the, that, the, that are going to graduate from the program. And based on the number of trainees that are going to graduate, they can meet those specific assets. Uh, is it clear, uh, Nathaniel or? Okay. Uh, Sorry about that. I thought my mic was on. Uh, okay, I, I understand it somehow. So can we do like first request? Like if I'm a trainee, I, I request for some uh, to be minted and after minted, I can opt in. Is that a possible logic? Yes, that's also possible, but there might be a lot of back and forth between the trainee and the admin because if you are going to first uh, request for an asset to be opted in or not to be opted in, but to be minted, then the admin is going to mint your asset. Then uh, you will again need to opt in for that asset. Then the admin can uh, transfer that asset. There might be lots of back and forth, but if you think that is a better implementation, you can go ahead with that implementation. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Andrew? So uh, I have uh, actually two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, 
uh, how can we make sure that the trainee opting uh, to the right asset? Uh, I was just uh, hoping uh, to, uh, I, I actually uh, uh, thought that we, maybe we can, when we mint the, when we mint the asset or when the admin or the owner of like, uh, the, I mean, uh, the service who gave the training, uh, mint the asset, maybe if we add the, the public key or public address of the trainees in the meta in the metadata and like make sure to uh, make sure to make sure just to make sure the trainee opting for the right uh, asset and so that we later we can see the list of uh, opt-in uh, opt-ins so like and give uh, transfer that and freeze the uh, asset so like can we actually do that or like how can we make sure that the training opting to the right uh, for the right uh, asset. Uh, okay, so when opting in, as I've uh, showed you earlier, I think uh, I have mentioned that you you are going to opt in using the asset ID, right? Uh, okay, yeah. it's on the documentation. Yes, you specify an index parameter, and that index is the asset ID that the uh, the certificate was minted in. So when you mint a certificate or when you mint any type of asset, it will return an asset ID. So you can implement different logics. One logic can be uh, to that on the training side, you can send some kind of notification of the asset ID. So based on that asset ID, you can opt in uh, for that asset. So opting in is also so, another transaction that is going to happen on the training side. It's going to charge him some algos. Uh, but he need to use this specific asset ID. If he doesn't use this specific ID, and when he try to opt in, uh, the the admin won't be able to send that specific asset to the trainee because that asset has been that that trainee hasn't opted in using that asset. So ID. how can we make sure that uh, the trainee opting for that specific asset ID? Well, we know like uh, we might not we might not like understand the, by just looking at the asset id that it is, we cannot understand that it is actually referring to our actual certificates so how can we make sure that the, uh, this won't happen uh um, okay i don't think we can because that's completely up to the trainee if he gets the asset id that he needs to obtain with i think asset id is a five digit number if he doesn't use that asset id how can we make sure that uh, that he opted in using that asset ID. That's totally up to the trainee. How can the trainee understand that the asset ID that he's uh, seeing in our application, for example, is uh, the his uh, uh, is the I mean uh, represents the actual uh, uh, asset? How that, that's going that? to be on the implementation like, of your application. Yes, no, actually that's going to be the implementation of your application. When you mint an asset, when the trainer uh, mints an asset, he will get an asset ID for each asset that he's going to mint, right? And the application should send that asset ID using a notification system or some kind of service to the trainee. And that trainee, when that trainee gets that asset ID, uh, he should be able to opt in because the application should make sure that that specific asset ID is going to the right training uh, using a notification system or some kind of uh, service. So as I've said, but uh, it's going to we, be uh, the training. Okay, sorry. Go, go, on, go. On. Okay, when the training means the, for, I mean the asset, he he has to or he or she has to like uh, add the public address of the training so that we can notify them that uh, I, I don't see yes. that being like yes. that. Uh, yes, yes, um, yes, we, we you need some kind of right? similar logic. Yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Adrian? Uh, so it's not a question, but uh, I was wondering if you could provide the, the sandbox in the pure stake notebooks. Sure, for reference. sure, I will, I will, I will. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I'm sorry guys, we are having a long session because uh, there are going to be two sessions. I, I don't think the second session is going to be long and the second session will be given by Nardos. It's going to be on building distributed application with Algorand blockchain. Over to you, Nardos. Okay, um, hi. So I hope you guys can hear me. Yes, we can hear. It already took a lot of time, so I'll try to meet. Okay, let's build the apps and let me just start my screen. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about how to build the apps using the Algorand blockchain. Um, so this tutorial for today is going to focus on the front end part. I would have preferred if we started from the contract development. Wait, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We're off. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, I don't know what happened. I think it's my connection or something. Um, so uh, I would have preferred if we if we started from the smart contract development because it would have shown you how to actually interact with the chain and what tools and language to, to use. Environment is already, I feel like is demotivating you and just to get you guys uh, started and you so that you can see some progress on your work we're just going to focus on the uh, actually building on the front end today so uh, if we have more time we can maybe go over the code as well but for now let's just focus on the the actual concepts of over what the apps are so what are DApps? So DApps or decentralized applications are any way of building applications and it's, they are becoming mostly adapted using on in different environments or in different sectors uh, in technology. And they are they're like normal apps, but but they offer um, something beyond what a normal or what we call the centralized application. Uh, get, uh, offer which is uh, they have they run on they run on blockchain applications or on, they are built on top of blockchain application and they offer similar functions but they differ is that they run on peer-to-peer -peer networks and they are used uh, they are built using smart contracts and um, so they are not purely owned by a, a one or a single authority the control lies beyond uh, is outside a single authority and there is no actually one person owning uh, the the apps so uh, the most famous uh, the apps that are built using the the app uh, that are built are BitTorrent, MetaMask and Tor so there are different kind of um, applications that are built using uh, blockchain and they are very popular and I'm sure most of you guys know it. So uh, what are the main differences between centralized application and decentralized application? Um, so the traditional or centralized application are used, they use a central HTTP protocols to communicate. 
So we usually have a backend that's hosted somewhere on a centralized server, maybe decentralized, but the whole concept of backend that's uh, that's there. So we we have a backend that's that are uh, let's say that we connect using the HTTP pro protocol that's hosted somewhere. But in D apps, there we're going to we of course we'll have a backend, but it's going to be at a, a decentralized on it's going to be on a decentralized blockchain technology that is hosted somewhere on a virtual machine. And this centralized application have different iteration process. So when we so when we build previously when we build web two applications or the traditional applications, we can iterate through our progress. We can add features that are just um, we can iterate through a process. We can fix bugs. We can mm, add features or something. But when we are building the apps, they are usually uh, so. When if we have a smart contract that is already deployed, then it's really hard to uh, change it, or it's not fixable. So it's already out there. So before actually deploying your D apps or smart contracts, let's say mostly the smart contract is going to be the one you need to be worrying about because you cannot once it's out there you cannot change it so it's already going to be published and so you might be able to change it but you're going to have passed through different it has its their own consensus protocol so it's going to be really hard to change and update this so once they're on the blockchain they're almost permanently going to be there so or they're not going to be changed or updated or tam tampered with. So the apps must be almost perfect before you release your smart contracts. Um, okay, so um, the main difference is in a nutshell there. So in, in uh, Web2, we have different usernames. We have different passwords for different applications right so sometimes you might use our emails sometimes we might use our uh usernames for to log into this with two applications or the centralized applications but in web3 applications or in d apps we usually have one wallet and we have one identity that is going to um that we're going to use so this is the main and the biggest difference between the web two and the web three is that um, we have one account or let's say wallet. So that's that's the one identity that we're going to use. Where in web two we have different accounts for almost every website. So we're not limited there, and uh, it's going to be hard to. It's going to be hard to actually actually um, hit it. So then we so uh, more data is controlled by users. So when this identity, this your almost all data you have on Web three is controlled by itself. You don't have is not controlled by another application or another uh, web site or corporate that owns that owns the website. For example, when you're using social media or something, you 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 might have the access to those things, but actually the website owners can access your um, data. So that is the main problem with Web two and that Web three is trying to solve. And um, you. Ownership to things are. And you don't have that ownership in, um, in Web2, right? So, like we said, we, it's going to be decentralized. And they're highly interoperable. Inter interoperable. So, in Web2, they're, they're, they're actually not that interoperable. And while it's have access, have public addresses and private keys that you guys just discussed right now, that are going to determine, that, that are going to de determine the user, but not actually set by their users. So you can't tamper with this case. So it's going to be set by, by to you and you cannot tamper with this public key or I mean private keys. So they're actually not tampered with and 
In Web2, you can access or you can change, update, or delete your usernames or passwords. So it's actually, uh, it's not just users are also here uh, limited to change the, or tamper with the, any information that's going to be on the Web3. Okay, so yeah, um, here we can see that um, we have one centralized uh, data or we may have different centralized data, but here on the apps, uh, we have uh, our application is run on different nodes and it's going to be dis and we, we have different What are the features of um, blockchain or DS? So, so we can see that they're open source. So uh, you can actually get a code of any DApp application that's out there, but you may need to pay for the for the service or for the code, but it's actually out there and anyone can be able to access them. Okay, um, and the second one is that their data are records their data and records are public so they you have a public ledger like we said um hidden so it's uh, out there for the public to see and anyone can access or see what um what you have uh done with the applications They're, they use a cryptographic token so, um, so to hide or to make the, our connections secure. So we'd have some tokens that are going to help us uh, secure our, our application. So this is the main feature of the app. And what are the benefits? So um, we've seen that it has some benefits, like as we discussed, since or um, ownership is the main thing but so here with the um, association or maybe let's say government can control the network so they cannot uh, cut down this Uh, Nardus, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Uh, we can't hear you first, please. Uh, we still can't hear you. On your screen, you can see that your mic is a little bit. We still can't hear you. Maybe can you try to rejoin?
Okay, so can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Um, I think it's my connection. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, I don't know which part I was breaking off. Maybe if you can. Should I just uh, continue where I left off or? Okay. okay, I think I'm still having issues. Okay, how about no risk? Uh, you're good, you can hear. <clears throat> okay, okay. So I'm just going to start off where. So um, we were talking about the benefits of uh, DApps or? Yes. Okay, so, um, so DApps have um, uh, this functionality that, that makes them better than Web2 or any decentralized application is that they're censorship resistant or there is no actually um, general um, association or something that's going to have control over the network. So there is no, there is not a single authority that's going to um, manage our application. So it's out to the public and no one actually has power to change or tamper with the data or in with our system and there is no there's not going to be a, a downtown downtime so when we are deploying our d apps or smart contracts it's deployed on different on multiple nodes or it's going to be deployed on peer-to-peer -peer system that ensures our d app continues to work even if um, a single computer or some part of the network goes down. So, um, and the third one is it's blockchain based. Yeah, like we said, there, there, it's going to be built using small contracts, and they can easily uh, integrate with different cryptocurrencies. So we can have different type of. So we this time we're going to be using the Algo cryptocurrency, and we can have Ethereum, or we can have different kind of blockchain or cryptocurrencies integrated with our functions or with our applications. And we can add, uh, you can build them on in our functions when we are creating our, our the apps. And the, the last one is they are open source. So like I said, they are out to the public and they're, they are they're spread over multiple networks and the ecosystem enables developers to build better apps with more um, useful or more in interesting functions and when it's out to the public and so the basic thing that is that they're decentralized application and so the basic difference between the web 2 is that they are run on a peer peer-to-peer -peer networks which is the blockchain uh so um it might have different weaknesses so when when it might have this all these benefits or features but um it's probably going to have some downtimes or disadvantages right so one thing is that it might be easily hack hackable because it's so this is why we need to focus on smart contract security management or when we are deploying or when we are testing our smart contracts uh there are many they are run on an open source environment so hackers have the opportunity to review your code and this can be uh, a probe to the network so they might be looking for weaknesses and this might lead to separate to hacks or it might lead to uh, different tampers in the 
in our applications. So uh, usability, um, another one is that a lot of apps have poor user interface. So we have to focus on, uh, you can, um, so we usually when uh, the apps are built, they're mostly focused on the blockchain part, so the backends, and uh, now it's being changed, but we have, so recently, the applications or the apps that are built are, so there's this study done and that they have really poor user interface and it was not mostly focused on the on the user interface and that that's the one thing that has been seen um, as a disadvantage or as a, uh, a bad thing from the D apps that has been built so far. So even the ones that you that I've mentioned have uh, they kind of have a poor interface and yeah that's okay yeah so so what are the application areas of um, the apps so um, there are different the apps done already so um, in let's say in a finance world it seems to be more popular and they are we are hearing a lot of uh find device or if have you if you have heard of device they're decentralized financial applications there are one application of the um, the apps is we can use them and in, in a finance sector and so uh the process can occur immediately so when we can have transaction and we can manage different our, our different financial um, transactions and using our dApps and using our uh, small contract technology and so like we said it's built on top of blockchain so that's going to be uh, great used for great greatly used for financial sectors or DeFi. so it can also be used in social medias um, so users can benefit a lot from social media dApps so when we're uh, so let's say Facebook so Facebook is uh, usually um, sued for using or tampering with users' data, right? Or stealing users' data. So we don't. If we use the apps or as a social as a social media, then we we're not we might not have this kind of issue. So we would greatly benefit if we up, we apply the concept of the apps in social media or um, in finance and. Um, and we can also have game games. So the uh, gaming has always been an interesting D app. So um, so currently games require dozens of hours invested on a single character to go. And there are different kind of games that are popular and it's more interesting solution in terms of value. So we have different, so currently uh, D apps or the whole concept of smart contract are a cryptocurrency currency based application are being seen on gaming applications so there are multiple uh, popular games that are rising that use the concept of uh, the app so these are the main uh, sectors that we can apply the apps in and another one is voting or government so we can use um blockchain so there are different countries that are already adapting uh, blockchain based voting system so a voting the app can open up the process to uh, the procedure using our, our smart smart contract and the community can vote on a list of uh, proposals or in, in different so we can have multiple uh, users voting on a system on a on our system and we can there is no there's not it's not going to be tampered with so our voting or our so i don't know what it's called our votes are going to be uh put into the public so it's not going to be tampered with or so there we're not going to have different issues rising with uh votings and if we apply the concept of blockchain to to create our voting system and we can also have a fundraising and advertising uh so we there are many users that take the advantage of ad blockers while using online so this is going to be um, a lot of pain for 
for those websites that that use ad based um that used um ad based advertising um let's say browser based advertising methods so it's going to be hard for them to generate revenue but there are some ways to add to add ads that have becoming uh new in the apps and a browser the app can fix this you might not have issues with uh this annoying ads that are going to be fluttering or um annoying you on while you're using something so this is um so this is our main uh, application area of the apps. So when we're building the apps on Algorand, so Algorand serves as um, an ecosystem for various blockchain development services. So we can uh, build smart contracts or you can build the apps to using the blockchain. So so when we, there are different uh, blockchain technologies that does not actually allow um, smart contract development let's say bitcoin does not do that so algorand is one of the best blockchain technology that we can use to build smart contracts and dApps and so we can use dApps on algorand by creating smart contracts using python and the pytl library that's going that's built on top of the pytl so or we can use the rich that's um, built on top of the javascript framework or library so the front end can be built in any language so we can so we can use different uh language to build our front end we can use python you can use go javascript different frameworks we can use c sharp and we can um use uh, rich rpc server this is a new technology that's not out um that's not popular yet but it's out there and it's possible to use these tools and so the main focus for developers using rich is the business logic or the back end so we use python library or rich to build the back end so we're going to use them to create our smart contracts so but in case of our front end we can use any language we want and so rich is um is modeled with a syntax and semantics similar to JavaScript. So it looks a lot like JavaScript. There are some features that makes it different, but which is uh, really similar to JavaScript. And if you are um, a JavaScript developer, or if you are, if you were familiar, familiar, if you're familiar with JavaScript, you can use Rich to uh, create your smart contract, and you can create, you can use you can use them to create your d apps and it allows developers to do more with less code so it's like we said it's javascript so it's going to be easier and python is um, a python language binding for algorand smart contracts so um they're implementing using a different language that is stack based or the the you it's what's it's called um uh, okay, and so it's a tra um, so Teal is a transaction execution approval language, and uh, Pytil is um, a more Python adapt uh, adaptation of Pytil since transaction uh, Teal is um, I forgot the word. Okay, anyways, uh, Pytil is a Python um, implementation of Teal, and we can use Pytil and Rich to design our smart contracts and to develop our um the apps so um so that's the first phase of the today's session um do you guys still want to continue with a session or should we wrap up here and continue next time because i wanted to show you some some parts of uh, the front end and how we can use a simple uh, react to design our our D apps or the front the front inside of our D apps, so what the clients can see. Should we continue or? Okay. Oh, cool. Okay, so I'll make it just short. Prefer next time. Okay, maybe we can vote on this because I know it's a holiday here in Ethiopia. We don't want to hold you guys.
back. Mm. Maybe next time. Doesn't have to be short. Okay, uh, let's raise our hand. Okay, here. I'm already um, way past the the intended the intended time, so so it will be tomorrow. We can continue tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure. We we also have um actually on Friday on Thursday, uh, we have a session about the smart contracts, and I would have really liked if you guys could start with that. But we can still continue and show you how to use the smart contract on implementing it on a React. Okay, yes, the bark. So, um, can you just like go over like briefly what we are supposed to deliver in the front end? If yeah, we are so, going to cover. Okay, okay, maybe let's let me just do that. So in the front end, so uh, you have different pages. So you would have you have two accounts, right? You have the trainee and you have the administrator side. So what the first thing the first thing is going to be that a a trainee is going to opt in for a a certificate, right? So whenever, let's say you have paid all your dues for Teen Academy, and if you want to take in, to receive the certificate, so you opt in, so you put in your public key or private key. I don't know how you guys have decided how you're going to implement it, but you're going to put some keys in and you're going to opt in for a request for the certificate. So this is going to be the first, uh, page for the trainee and for the administration administration side you'd have so you you would have a list of trainees that have opt in so you would have uh, different trainees that have requested for the certificate so if you have multiple of multiple trainees then that would be listed so for the administration side you would have a list and it, on every trainee list you are you're going to accept or decline that request so um, you would have uh, your own reasons to do this so you might um, you might implement some things in your smart contract but probably you're not going to have enough time to do that but um, you can uh, you're going to accept or decline the request so when you accept uh, if you decline then it's going to be uh, removed from the administration side so a trainee can again request, but it's not going to be visible for the administration side, right? So, uh, the request, then you're going to mint the certificate and you're going to transfer that this minted certificate or the, this asset to the to the users. And so, this is going to be done on the administration side. But so, when we go when you come back to the trainee side, this is this might be on the same page, or you can use another page or you can actually I, you, it would be a lot easier if you could just use one page so you can render different um, responses so if that request is accepted and if the administrators decide to um, to uh, send or to transfer this certificate to the trainees then it's going to be sent to the trainees so this is going to be just a general look of the the application that you're going to build by the end. Does that answer your question, Mark? Is that you? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. yes, Sandin. So uh, we have to, uh, we, we also have to like uh, implement a wallet connection in order for yes to do yes, all these transactions, course. like a signing, a signing process. We use that. Yes. Uh, but like, I have one, another question. Uh, my question is, uh, how can we uh, prevent users from like creating an asset? What do you mean? I mean, like, uh, I was hoping like uh, yeah, uh, the admins, admin can mint uh, uh, an asset, right? Yeah. So how can we like restrict or how can we differentiate uh, signed in users? From like admin and uh, uh, admin and so that's going to be the 
Okay, so that's going to be the main job. Then, so we're you're going to use smart contract to handle all of this. So, uh, you can't, and not anyone can mint or transfer the assets. So you need to write smart contracts that are different functions that are going to handle this. So you're going to add the senders, or you're going to have to add the address somewhere, and you're going to store it in your smart contract, and then you're going to validate based on those stored addresses. So this is where the concept of smart contracts come in, and you're going to use smart contract to handle this. Okay, uh, if we were to use a smart contract, so like if I decided to use a, a node backend, so uh, we don't have a, actually a, a way of writing a smart contract using node, but there is a, a reach is different than node. So like how, where does the smart contract live and how can we interact with it? Is it possible okay, so, to just explain in a nutshell? So yeah, cool. So uh, you you don't you're not going to use node to generate your smart contract. So when you use reach and after you have uh, you, so you're going to build your smart contract when you're done with uh, writing your all your functions that are going to handle all of this um, uh, asset generation or transferring or minting. You're going to deploy those, build those, and deploy them on a testnet server. So there is, uh, I'm not sure what. Okay, I'm going to show you where you might host or deploy your uh, smart contract, but it's going to be. There you would have this taste needs. So Algorand has its own taste need that you can host or serve or deploy your smart contract. So you're going to, after you have served the smart contract, then you're going to use this address, the address of your smart contract that is deployed on the Algorand taste need, and you're going to add that or add the link or URL to the to your uh, front end or back end or wherever you are you want to implement it. So you would have uh, you would have it deployed to so somewhere. It means okay. like I could separately build my smart contract and deploy it on the test net or on the blockchain. And I could yes. uh, so okay, I, I can I have a what uh, an API to access uh, that uh, smart contract in my backend so that I can make sure Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. So if you if you have so this might be a simple application, but if you uh, have something a complicated application that you build that you have different smart contract deployed or if so if you have different uh, a smart contract that you use in your application, then you can actually use uh, a proper backend that is going to interact with this deployed applications. So yes, you can have a backend. Yes, not tonight. Uh, I have like, the same question as Andernets, but uh, can we use like our own logic to prevent like trainees to create uh, an asset? Our own logic, for example, if I have, if you have, if we have one admin, we can just mm -hmm. add the admin's address and allow or disallow the address, the, the request based on that. Uh, just pre to prevent us deploying and writing smart contract we just can we just apply a simple logic to that without writing a, a smart contract okay what if you have multiple admins or so you're going to have i don't know like an if else, if if else statement if if the request is coming from this type of users and if it's you're going to reject everything that's other than that one is that what you're planning? Uh, I I think uh, uh, it's in all uh, it's all in my head. But for example, yeah, I we, understand. Uh, it might work, yeah. but what if you have multiple uh, trainees or admins? So this is your solution could be good for like few people, but we're building a system that's going to be uh, adapted. So if you guys are able to do really good, then academy might actually use this application for themselves so um we can we can use this every time a trainee uh, pays off their debts or you can use this to issue the certificates so it, it may not be ideal to 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 multiple users so uh, you, you might have, yeah so that's the main problem and 
why not generate smart contract that is going that's going to be built once and going to be accessed uh, anytime in the future as well? Okay, yes. My, my question slash my issue is here is like the time we spend on figuring out to write a smart contract is going to be like a lot more than just creating some group. For example, we can create some staff group and we can just add that user or give them uh, an authority for that. For example, we can have a Boolean field like is a staff, true or false. We can build our logic based on that. Uh, I think this this will take somehow less time to implement uh, main logic, like maintaining open yes. Yeah, I do believe that. But um, so this challenge is so that you you are more um, comfortable to use or to implement this uh, this technology, so that it makes it makes your future work easier. So you might have a way around this project, but why not build it in a more uh, secure or scalable way? And why not make it powerful instead of just having um, one way of doing it that's that's one issue i have for you but you can but that would not be a web 3 project right you would not you, you would need to be using the blockchain or you need to have the concept of smart contract in your application to make it a web 3 application or to call it a d app right you're right, you're right. You're, yeah 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 I, I get your point but using the algolan the APIs to create the opt-in and also minting the PDFs that make it a Web3 app, right? Like if yeah. you have a special, yeah. if you add that, if you add the decentralized storage, that will be the Web3 app, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay yes. And then, is that a question or was that a previous no, I, question? I actually like uh, wanted to add. To, I mean. Uh, you you said it already, but like it, it would be a web to technology if we're gonna use this, implement this logic on our backend. It could be hacked, so like someone can just tweak that section of the code and uh, eventually become a, a trainee. Uh, I mean, a trainer who can like mint uh, that. So like uh, it would be, it would not be web three project. So that's exactly, yeah. Okay, so ooh, oh, so it's really late. So I will just maybe uh, go over the front end part when we're uh, when we're doing the smart contract. I'll just make that session really fast so that we can implement this the front end part as well. Uh, sorry, guys. Today's session took way more time than we intended, but hope you guys got to learn a lot of things. So I hope it was um, somehow enlightening for you guys. So, so yeah, that's, if you don't have any more questions, that's the end of today's session. Okay, thank you everyone.